Welcome to Kidmount Baptist Church in the great community of Kidmount, Ontario, Canada. We've been trotting through the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And we've come to chapter 17. Last week we took a look at what I think is probably the most terrifying chapter in the whole Bible, where we see the wrath of God poured out in the bowl of judgment, the last seven bowl judgments, which ends the judgments of God on this earth, which ends the wrath of God being poured out on this earth. I'm not going to do a review today. Some will say hallelujah. I know that. But I will, um, because I'm going to do something a little bit different today, and I just trust that you'll stick with me on this and that the Lord will help me through it. I changed my sermon on Friday night at 11 o'clock. And um, the Lord's been giving me that proverbial kick in the rear end the last two or three weeks. And I've ignored him at first, and then I decided that I better uh, do what he has for me. He's a great God. He's a great God. Chapter 17 and chapter 18, what I was going to do, and I'll make this quick, is I was going to do what we did last week and just go right through it and talk about every verse, and we're not going to do that today. We have spent weeks and weeks on this terrible period of time called the tribulation period. And you know it. Those of you who have been here, you know it. It begins when the Antichrist, I'm not going to do a review, when the Antichrist and Israel sign the peace covenant. It ends when Jesus comes back with his church. Those seven year, that seven year period. And we spent weeks upon it knowing what's coming. Have chapter 6 all the way through to chapter 19 on this book of 22 chapters dedicated to the tribulation period. When we got to chapter 14, verse 8, it says this Another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, for she who has all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And then later in chapter 16, last week, we got to chapter 16, verse 19. The great city, Jerusalem, was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of his fierce wrath. Now, when it says remember, it doesn't mean God forgot about it. This is the time that John's going to write about it. And it's fascinating to me that as we go all the way through these 21 judgments, and some of them are given to us quickly, and some of them John spends more time, a few more verses on them. And so we got to pay a little bit better attention. We should be paying attention to all of them, of course. And we get all the way through the 21 judgments. And he dedicates two full chapters now. 17 and 18. To one thing. And we call it, he calls it, the mystery Babylon the Great. So what is it about this Babylon? What is it about this? I want you to turn with me to chapter 17. I'm only going to read the first six verses until later. Verse 1 of chapter 17 of the book of the Revelation. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls from chapter 16 came and spoke with me saying, Come here. I will show you the judgments of the great harlot who sits on many waters, many, many humanity, many, many people with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of, immor of her immorality. 
And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and, and ten horns. And if you remember back in Daniel, if you remember earlier on in Revelation 13, 1, uh, we know who that beast is. That's the Antichrist. And here he's called Scarlet. Why is he called Scarlet? Because of the blood that's been spilt since back in chapter 13. And we won't spend more time on that. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on this woman's forehead, a name was written, a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, with a plural. <coughs> harlots. And of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. John wondered greatly. Brief moment of prayer. Father, please guide us this morning as we open your precious word. And may you be pleased by it for Christ's sake. Amen. Today I want to give you a glimpse, and I mean a glimpse. We only got a few minutes here. I want to give you a glimpse of this mystery Babylon. This mystery Babylon the Great. We have two chapters before us. And the first chapter we talked about previously is Babylon and its religion. And so the judgments on the religious system from Babylon is chapter 17. Chapter 18 is the political system. This is the judgment on the political system. The economic system is mentioned there as well. But it's the political system that chapter 18 really hones in on. Of Babylon. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. If you go back to Genesis... And we have been in our Sunday school class. And James has done a fantastic job and continues to do a fantastic job in Genesis. If you go back to chapter 10 and chapter 11, we're introduced to Babylon. Noah had three sons. I'm hesitating here because how deep do I go with this? How far back do I go? Noah had three sons. Shem? Anybody? Ham? Excellent. And they had wives. So there's how many now? Eight. And on the ark. Before they get to the ark, while they're on the ark, and after they get off the ark, God told them to do something. He said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Spread out. Well, we find out as we study the scriptures that they were fruitful and they multiplied. They didn't want to spread out. They didn't want to fill the earth. And we're introduced to a guy who comes from a guy who comes from Ham. So Ham has a son named Cush and Cush has a son he has a bunch of sons. And one of them is named Nimrod. And the Bible stops for a minute and gives some description of this one because the rest is, you know how quick the Bible goes through the generations. <laughs> Nimrod became a mighty hunter. Nimrod made cities, city after city after city. So we're talking two, three hundred years after the flooding. Okay? And what had happened was, and you can get into the history books, the Bible doesn't give us all of this stuff, but the history books are very plain and there's lots of them. They formed their own religion. They had rebelled already against the God who had just saved the earth from complete destruction. His name was Nimrod. And Nimrod led the pack. Even Nineveh. You remember Nineveh in Assyria later on? He built Nineveh. But the first place he built was called Babel, Babel, later called Babylon. And you know the story. You should know the story of the Tower of Babel. Right? What happened there? They wanted 
it all on men. They wanted all the glory for building this tower to heaven. And we will be great. And what happened? Well, we were fruitful, we multiplied, and we love our city. And we love our city. And God says, and he comes down, they come down, the three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I believe, and they confuse the language. I'm not going to spend any more time on that. The language gets confused. We don't know how many different languages God gave them all, but they were so confused. And by the way, that's what Babel means, confusion, that they left each other. Families left other families. They, they took off and spread out exactly what God had wanted them to do in the first place. And they took this false religion with them around the world. Well, the known world at that point, this religion was taken by the folks that spread out from Babel, Babylon. What's the big deal, Bruce? Well, I'm going to ask you that a few times as we go through this. Nimrod had a wife. Her name was Samarimus. <clears throat> Ultimately, Samarimus had a child whose name was Tammuz. Nimrod died, and when Nimrod died, he was cut up into pieces. And they burned his pieces. And they took his ashes, and they spread it all around his kingdom. The kingdom that he was the leader of. In fact, he was worshipped. He was a god. To him. Interesting stuff. After he died, Tammuz was born. Samarimus declared that Nimrod was the sun god. But now Tammuz, his son, is now the sun god. And she is the high priestess of this religion in this territory. Fascinating. But then she declared that Tammuz was the resurrected Nimrod. Are you with me so far? We just got nicely started. <laughs> so Samarimus was worshipped as the first high priestess of this religion. Later, she was called the Queen of Heaven. Tammuz was worshipped as the Sun God, later known several different names. We know him well in the scriptures as Baal. And Baal was represented then, this takes a little time, by fire, by the trees, by fish, a whole bunch of different animals. And so what we see here is the beginning of this new religion, the mother, Samarimus, son, Tammuz, religion. And now it's being spread throughout the known world at that time. If you dig up the books, and some of them, we got some pretty good ones, I can talk to you later about some of the books if you're interested in them. Mythologically, Tammuz turns 40, and he's killed by a wild boar. The priestesses of the temple that Samarimus was the high priestess at that time, later to become the queen of heaven, they all wept, lamented for Tammuz, their god, for 40 days, one day for each of his years that he was on the earth. That spring, after the 40 days, the crops were better than they've ever been. And of course, because of that, it was very easy for them to say, it was Tammuz that did this. We wept for Tammuz, and the crops are fantastic. Fascinating. This individual that was represented by animals, this god, this sun god, this Baal. Well, before we go on, I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I think Paul deals with this very thing in Romans chapter 1, which is a, a classic chapter. It's right after Acts, Bruce. Okay, there we go. Get down to verse 21 with me. And this is Paul speaking. For even though they knew God, they didn't honor him 
as God, or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Man had rejected the God of heaven for this. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the normal, natural functions for that which is unnatural. Boy, does that sound familiar today, Paul. Remember the Tower of Babel. Remember Nimrod. God confused them. They spread the earth. So what happened? We have a false religion beginning in Babylon that spreads around the earth. This false religion spread. And this is fascinating to me. It spread. Samarimus, Tammuz, mother, child, worship. What happened as it spread across the earth? A lot of the names changed depending on what, well, they became countries. They weren't all, they weren't all countries when they got there. But they became countries and the names changed. And if you went to Egypt, it was Isis and Horus. If you went to Greece, that name was Aphrodite and Eros. If you went to ancient Rome, remember ancient Rome? Venus and Cupid. If you went to India, Devaki and Krishna. Anybody heard of Krishna? Hare Krishna? Mid-60s, big religion in downtown Hamilton. Phoenicia. Phoenicia, the seafaring people that was just the north of, of Israel. It was Ashtark and Tammuz. The Queen of Heaven, Samarimus, was called then the Queen of Heaven as well. And she made herself to be known as the wife of Baal. She was also called the Virgin Queen of Heaven. Fascinating to me. Fascinating. Later on, hundreds of years later, in England she's called my lady. In the Latin, she's called Mia Domina. In the Italian, she's called Madonna. In 333 AD, so we're going fast forward here, 333 AD, Constantine wants to become Pontifex, Pontifus Maximus. What's that mean? He wants to be not only the political leader of this of these territories, he wants to be the religious leader as well. And the only way he can figure this out, because Christianity in 333 AD was alive and well and doing very well. And he had to get the Christians on his side. And he had a dream and all that stuff. I can't, I don't have time to get into that today. But he woke up that morning and says, I got the answer. We're going to combine Christianity with this false religion. And he does. And it's very easy. Very easy. From that, we got Mary and Jesus. Mother, son, worship. So the apostasy started way back. The apostasy continued all the way through. It, it, it ebbed and flowed, but it even continues today, folks. And the Bible tells us in Revelation that all the harlotry, false religions, and as we've been going through Luke, what's Jesus been doing? And what's a, you, you go to Peter, you go to James, you go to John, you go to Paul, and it's all about false religion, the false teaching, and it all started back in Genesis. Back in Genesis. We have it today. What about Israel? God's people. 
Well, if you go into the book of the Judges, what happens in Judges? I'll make this quick. I think there's five cycles, maybe six. Five or six cycles. Where Israel turns their back on God. I mean, they've got out... Anyway, sorry. I don't have to focus. They got out of the promised land. Here we are, and Joshua is leading them. And here we are later on in Judges. And Judges, what happens? God has prospered them, and they have turned their backs on God. So God sends a prophet over and over again. What happens? Prophet comes. You've got to repent. Finally, because they have some consequences, they repent, and by golly, God blesses them again. And we go through that. And when they're in their blessed stage is when they take it on themselves to just turn their backs on their father, their heavenly father. And so God sends another prophet. And it goes over and over. And that's the book of Judges. And at the end of the book of Judges, it says what? Does anybody know? They did right in their own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes. Fascinating book. Great study. Not too uplifting. But it is a great study. So what happened with Israel? Okay, I think I mentioned Phoenicia. So let's go back to 870 BC, roughly, roughly right in there. Northern Kingdom Israel has a king named Ahab. Anybody heard of Ahab? Sunday school? Nobody? Four or five of us? Oh, come on, seriously. Okay, oh, good, good, good. Okay. You're not falling asleep on me here? Good. Ahab had a lovely wife, and her name was Jezebel. Jezebel happened to come from Phoenicia. Remember that seafaring country north of Israel? And Jezebel was bad lady. Bad lady. And with that bad lady stuff came this false religion. And she introduced it when she married Ahab as king of Israel to Israel. Big time. Big time. Let's take a few minutes. Come over with me to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 7. Now you got to know Jeremiah. He was a prophet of God. It was around 600. B.C., where he was the prophet of God. This is before the fall of Israel, before the fall of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah, poor old Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, I mean, he's another great study we maybe should do someday. It might take me about 12 years to get through it. But <laughs> Jeremiah, he confronts the folks really well. I can't wait to meet him someday. Well, I can wait a little while. <laughs> Chapter 7, verse 18. He's talking about it. And he says in verse 18 of chapter 7, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough. Knead. Kneading. Yes, everybody knows what the kneading of dough. I know that everything's quick, quick bake now, but the, the kneading of wool, of, of, of dough, to do what? To make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me, God says. Do they spite me, declares the Lord? Is it not themselves they spite to their own shame? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place. A little prophecy there on man and on beast and on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the grounds, and it will burn and not be quenched. Queen of heaven. Cakes, dough, Jeremiah chapter 44, please, Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 17, uh, 16, as for the message that you've spoken to us, this is them talking to Jeremiah, in the name of the Lord, we're not going to listen to you, wow. They actually said, we're not listening to you, Jeremiah. But rather, we will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to who? The Queen of Heaven. And pouring out drink offerings to her, just as we ourselves, our forefathers, our kings, and our princes did in the cities of Judah. That's the southern kingdom. And in the streets of Jerusalem. And for there, 
pardon me, for then we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no misfortune. But since we stopped burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything. It's all about how much stuff we have, right? And have met our end by the sword and by famine. And said the women, when we were burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and were pouring out drink offerings to her, was it without our husbands that we made for her sacrificial cakes in her image and poured out drink offerings to her? Jeremiah knew what was going on. Around the same time, there's a man named Ezekiel. Ezekiel prophesied around 600 as well. well. We won't get into Ezekiel here much today, except I want you to turn to chapter 8 with me in Ezekiel. Now remember this. We're in about 600 B.C. In 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys the temple. He comes and destroys Jerusalem. He had three sieges, came in, temples wiped out. What's the big deal? You'll, you'll understand in just a second. So we're before that period. Just before that period. Ezekiel chapter 8. We'll start at verse 3. He stretched out. Here's Ezekiel talking. God stretched out, or the angel stretched out the form of a hand and caught me by the lock of my head. And this, that wasn't Elijah, obviously. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in the visions to God of God to Jerusalem. So the entrance of the north gate. Where are we? We're in Jerusalem. We're at the temple. We're at the north gate of the inner court. We're the seat of the idol of jealousy. Now, the idol of jealousy, just for quick reference, Manasseh, the worst king that ever lived. By the way, he got saved. The worst king that ever lived, according to the scripture, put this temple, put this temple, put this idol at the beginning of the temple. And it's still there. Behold. I re pardon me. Where am I? He said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes now toward the north. So I raised my eyes toward the north. And behold, to the north in the altar gate was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here at the temple? So that I would be far from my sanctuary, says God, but yet you will see greater abominations than this. What's going on? What's going on? Then he brought me to the entrance of the court, and when I looked, behold, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, now dig through the wall. <laughs> so I dug through the wall, and behold, an entranceway. And he said to me, You go in there, and you see the wicked abominations that they are committing here. And so I entered, and I looked, and behold, every form, this is in the temple of God, every form of creeping things and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. Standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel. Moses had been told, you choose 70 elders. They have their 70 elders. Here they are. With Jazniah, the son of Shaphan, and that's another story, earlier on, standing among them, each man with his censer in his hand and the fragrance of a crowd of cloud of incense rising. And he says to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house are committing in the dark? Each man in the room of his carved image, they're in the dark. For they say, what? The Lord does not see us. We're hiding from him. And the Lord has, for he's forsaken this land, our land. And he said to me, you're going to see even greater abominations, which they're committing. So he brings me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, women were sitting there doing what? Weeping for Tammuz in the temple of God. And he said, do you see this, son of man? Yet you'll see still greater abominations. Which, what could be worse than that? Greater abominations. And he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the entrance to the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, I should have a diagram here, were about 25 men with their backs to the temple 
of the Lord and their faces toward where? The east. And what were they doing? They were prostrating themselves toward the east. The west side of the temple was the Holy of Holies. They turned their backs on the Holy of Holies and they prostrated themselves toward the east. Does that sound familiar today? Our Muslim Islam friends. If you go on in chapter 8, 9, and 10, <coughs> before 586, <clears throat> the glory of God, that Shekinah glory. Remember back, Israel gets out of Egypt, cloud, fire, God leaves them, leads them with his Shekinah glory. And we see it in many places throughout. You get to Ezekiel chapter 8, 9, and 10, and you will see a gradual leaving of the Holy of Holies by the glory of God. By the glory of God. Enough's enough. I'm out of here. In my turn. If we don't see the glory of God coming back to this earth, so we're just, we're just around 600 B.C. When's the next time God's glory is shown on this earth? Anybody know? No hand? No. There were in the same country shepherds <laughs> abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and said, what? What happened? The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. That was the next occurrence. Of God's glory, that Shekinah glory, coming back. And we get a glimpse of it sometimes in Mount Transfiguration. We get a glimpse of it. But we never again see the fullness of God's glory. And when Jesus comes back and sets up his throne during the thousand, you've heard me say this before, the thousand year reign. One of the reasons there has to be a millennium is because the, 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 the manifestation of the glory of God on Jesus the Christ the one who's leading, the one who is our Savior and Lord, has to happen. And it won't happen. It never has happened. It won't happen until he comes back and sets up his throne. All the nations will see him. They will see that manifestation, that full manifestation of his glory. And so it continues. That mother-child worship, the mother of all false religion, and it's demonic, is straight out of Satan's playbook. And as James said in our class this morning, he doesn't care which doctrine you have. He doesn't care how many gods you have. He doesn't care who you worship, as long as it's not God Almighty and his Son, the Lord Jesus. And so, it begins in Genesis. But it ends does end. Turn with me. Revelation, please. Chapter 17. Go down to 14, verse 14 of chapter 17. And I've skipped a whole bunch here. If you really want a good study here, do 17 and 18. Make a list, actually. These will wage war against the Lamb. So all these anti-people are, are against God. And the Lamb will overcome them. Why? Because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called and chosen and the faithful. We know that that's part of the Battle of Armageddon. And we're going to see that Battle of Armageddon in chapter 19, how it's fulfilled. I'm having fun with this microphone here this morning. Actually, fun's not the word I would use. And we'll take a look at that when we get to chapter 19. When we go to chapter 18, we're now talking about another system. This is the political system. 
in chapter 18. This is political Babylon. Let's start at verse 2. I'll, I'll read a few verses. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons and prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. And for her sins have raised, piled up as high as heaven. I love that because if you go back to the Tower of Babylon, where were they trying to go? They were going to high, as high up into heaven as they could go. And here they are. Their sins are piling up to the high heavens, as my mother would say. Where am I? Let's stop there and go to verse 11. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her. Why? Because no one buys their cargoes anymore. So it gets a little bit into the economy as well. But all the merchants are devastated. They can't sell their wares any longer because Babylon has been destroyed by God. Destroyed by God. Let's finish up by going to verse... Down to verse 20. All of this stuff has happened. All of this judgment has happened. It's, it's awful. This Babylon has been wiped out. And verse 20 says this. Because it's very easy to get negative on this and feel kind of down in the dumpster about this because of all the stuff that's going on. And there might be friends of mine that will still be there when it's destroyed, you know. So you do think on the negative side. But then you get to verse 20. And it says this. Rejoice over her, O heaven, you saints and apostles and prophets. Why? Because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. For you against her. The chief enemy of mankind has just been destroyed on this earth. Fascinating. Comes to an end. And then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone, threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, this great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And that goes back to Daniel chapter 2. And then it does a little bit of a resume here. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. Why? For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations, catch that? All the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And it's fascinating to me. That word sorcery is pharmakia in the Greek. Pharmakia, and it actually has the connotation of getting high on pharmacy. See that around anywhere today? Absolutely amazing to me. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who've been slain on the earth. Now, do you remember with me back in chapter 6? The martyrs were at the base of the altar. Those who have been killed during the tribulation period. How long, O oh Lord, do we have to wait to avenge our blood? said, hold on just a little longer. Hold on just a little longer. This is it. This is it. So they're avenged. And it says in 20, rejoice over her. Rejoice, O heaven. Amazing. I know I'm going to get asked this. So I think I'll preempt this by giving you the answer before you ask it. Because I remember asking this as a teenager when I first studied this. Who is Babylon? Well, we know for sure that it's a system. It's a political system. 
It's a religious system. It began back in Genesis. We know that for sure. And we also know, based on our studies these last weeks, who's leading them. Antichrist will be leading them during that seven-year period of time. That's certainly the political. It'll be a one-world government. We also know that it'll be a one-world religion. Guess what religion? Well, it's a false religion. It doesn't matter if it's, and I won't name names, it doesn't matter which religion, it's the false religion. And we know the false prophet, the sidekick of the first beast, the Antichrist, is the guy that's going to be leading it. And by the way, <laughs> the political system rubs out the religious system. If you read through chapter 17, you'll realize that they don't want any glory given to the religious system. Fascinating. Fascinating to me. So, Bruce, what, what about, like, I thought maybe perhaps it was a real city. Well, you know what, folks? I believe that it is, there is a geographical component to Babylon. I really do believe that. Because all the way through the scriptures, it talks about her, about it, about her. Yes, the system. There's no question about system. But yes, geography too, I believe. Now, when I was a teenager into my early, early 20s, and a little bit later, we thought, I thought, many thought, that old Babylon was being restored, and it was. Sudan Hussein, anybody heard of him, or am I just dating myself here? Okay, he rebuilt Babylon. And I thought, maybe there's a good shot here. That might be the old city revived. Other people think it's Rome. Other people think it's New York City. This is true. You can read, you can read up on it, and, and, and uh, some guys, a lot of guys think it's uh, North America. I'll tell you, a lot of the Christian Mus Muslims who have become Christians honestly believe it's Mecca. And they go through all the different things that 17 and 18 describe, and they go, hey, it's got to be Mecca. And others, it's got to be New York. Others, it's got to be North America. And I'm going to tell you what I think. I think it would be very wise for me not to give you my opinion. Because <laughs> that doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. The important point here is, are you saved? Are you going to miss this? Because if you're alive at this time, we just went through the wrath of God last week with all the bowls and vials of seven. And you don't want to be here then. You don't. Many of you, most of you who go into the tribulation will be killed before then. But there's going to be thousands upon thousands upon thousands that at the end, in the wrath, the seven, the seven bowls, There'll be hundreds of thousands of people wiped out. And we saw the judgment last week. But you don't want to be here. Then. You don't have to be. There's no reason for you to be here. The church has been raptured back in chapter 4, verse 1. We've gone to heaven. We've had the judgment seat of Christ already before this happened. We get our, re our rewards based on what we've done here for him, for Jesus here in this world, and what our motivations have been. That's when it happens, is when we get to heaven. That's going to take some time. The other thing that happens in heaven, and you want to be there then, is he gets married to us. The wedding ceremony happens in heaven with his bride. Those who've been saved since Pentecost right up to the rapture. That's the bride of Christ. And that happens during the seven-year tribulation. In heaven. Not on earth. In heaven. And then he tells us very clearly, and we'll get to this next week. He's coming back. With his bride. That's us. Those of us who are saved. So how do I get saved, Bruce? Well, you know how you get saved. You acknowledge the fact, as we all are and have been, that we're sinners. We're sinners. You've got to repent of that sin. That means turn around go the other way. Repent of that sin and embrace Jesus as the only one, the only one, who can save you. Krishna can't save you. Cameras can't save you. Mary can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. And then you ask for forgiveness. 
and he will forgive you all your sins that you ever committed and the sins that you ever will commit. You're forgiven. You go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Like that. Forever and forever. And why are we still here, Bruce? Why don't we just, when you get saved, just go to heaven? He's given us a job to do. Folks, church, we got a job to do. Tell others. Spread the seed. Live the life. Show them. In this world, it's going to get tougher. It's going to get tougher, and I'm not going to give a sermon on that right now. It's going to get tougher. It's up to us to be the light, reflecting our Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And when we step into eternity, we'll probably just forget about what's happened here because eternity will be before us because of what he did at Calvary. What he did at Calvary. He loved us so much he endured the cross for what the joy set before him. For the joy set before him. He couldn't wait. He didn't want to go. But he did it because his father asked him to do it. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And he did it for you and for me, for the whole world. And we have the opportunity of living with him for eternity. Tell your friends, tell your tell your family. Tell your colleagues what Jesus has done for you. And you will never, ever, ever regret it. Because it's for his sake. It's for his sake. Father, we thank you again for your precious word. Father, forgive me for, for stumbling a bit this morning. But thank you, Father, for the truth. And Father, as we live our lives for you, may you be pleased. And may we depend on you. May we trust you more than men as you've asked us to do. And we pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen.